the purpose then of psychology? Like why even have it as a class or a, um, uh, a field of study? Like what's the benefit of it? Before we get into the experiments here, like why even have it? What's the point? Why would I want psychology? It's not in the notes. You're just having to think about it. To learn how, what we, what, why we do the things we do. Ooh, I like that. There we go. So psychology. Uh, so you would say it's practical then. So uh, why we do uh, or think what we do. That's an excellent use for it. It's practical. So I can understand maybe why I'm particularly happy at this moment or unhappy at this moment uh, or what's going to help me out in the future. Um, I can use the knowledge of psychology, uh, hopefully, to make my life better, make my family's life better, my community's life better, everyone's life better. Because if you uh, are suffering for some reason, um, it's generally helpful to find out why you're suffering and avoid it, right, or fix it. And psychology can be a, a wonderful tool for that. The only problem is it's really hard to do because that spectrum I showed you guys, you never know what the actual thing is that's causing uh, suffering or pain or happiness or, or, or fulfillment or whatever it is. Uh, but the field of psychology itself gives us some answers, some general answers to, okay, here's kind of how humans work. So if you're experiencing this difficulty, like say you're depressed or anxious, here's an array of things it could be. So you can go through the line sort of with a therapist or with your own knowledge and try to figure out, all right, which one of these things is making me miserable? And you can try to work out what it is, remove it, fix it, whatever, and then make your life much better. All right, and that's, that's something that psychology can be used for, and that's largely what it is used for. So we're trying to figure out how humans work and uh, hopefully trying to make people's lives more uh, enjoyable and better and improve it. All right, cool. So if that's what I'm doing, so psychology. Find out why we, uh, how we work and, and, and why we think the things we do. And the goal is, hopefully, uh, to, uh, can we agree that a good goal for psychology is to uh, decrease suffering? Mm -hmm. That sound like a good objective and goal there? Mm -hmm. Figure out why, why we're upset, um, depressed, anxious, sad, miserable, whatever, and try to reduce that. That's something that most people can agree is, is a generally a, a good goal. Right, make the world better by making us suffer less. Okay, that's a good goal of psychology. Why do I need psychology to do it then? Why can't I just try things? Because there's so many factors and you can be trying things forever. Yeah, exactly. So I've only got so many years on the earth uh, and I've only got so many ideas. I can only try so many things. Uh, so if I were to just like start from zero every time a person's born and try to figure out what makes me happy, um, by the time I figure it out, even if I do, it might be, be way late. So this way we can kind of uh, share information uh, and drastically reduce the amount of time it takes us to figure this out. But also, it's hard to tell what is causing you to be unhappy or happy, right? So you de generally need um, a field of study with lots of people that, that can try different things uh, and test different results to see what's actually working and what's not working. Okay, cool. So this is why we need experiments, essentially. So experiments. So why do we need them? Why do we need experiments? To figure out what works. Okay, how does an experiment show you what works and what doesn't? Uh, it tests and either confirms or denies theories and Okay, so you'd have a theory and you want to test it, okay. Um, what's wrong with me just um, doing what I think think or feel is the best thing to do? Your bias. Your bias. Cool. What, is a, what does bias mean? Having like a favor or like, you know, have your own judgment without actually facts, like opinion before facts. Okay, cool. Um, so there's a thing called intuition, which we'll get into in a second. But yeah, uh, bias. So bias is your predisposition or favoring of one answer over the other. Do all humans have that or no? Yeah. Every single human does, right. And it's really hard sometimes for us to see where we're biased. Uh, like for example, a lot of psychologists in the past, they either favored nature as the biggest determining factor or they favored nurture as the biggest determining factor. 
So when they'd go out and try to find out which one it is, they weren't really trying to find out what it, what it was, whether it was nature or nurture. What were they trying to find out? Yeah. How they were right. Exactly. Um, and this is something humans do all the time. It's called confirmation bias. What we do is, if we have an opinion, like let's say I favor the nurture explanation for how we are, I'm really likely to take any information that supports nature and just dismiss it. And I'm gonna look for anything I can find that supports the nurture part, and I'm gonna cling to it like it's the, like the, the all answer, essentially. Uh, and that's what people do. So experiments help, they don't completely, but they help eliminate bias. And again, bias is that, uh, that quality of human beings that we all have where we favor one answer over the other. All right, and what that causes us to do is uh, accept ideas uh, that, that go along with what we believe and uh, reject even legitimate things that might uh, contradict us, okay? All right, so another thing that we want to avoid besides the bias is a thing called intuition. <laughs> what is intuition? <coughs> that one's not in the notes. What's intuition? Yeah. It's like your internal feelings are like, Yeah, okay, cool. So this is what, I like the words used there. So what I would say is, the way I would just kind of reorganize those would be, it's definitely a feeling you get. It's like a sense of being right or wrong without actually knowing if you're right or wrong. Okay, so here's an example. And here's an example why we need to experience. All right, um, so <coughs> intuitively, Let's take a person who's got a really bad fear, a phobia, an extreme fear, okay? Um, I don't remember what it's called, but this is a common one. A fear of elevators. Yes, they're, they're afraid that they're gonna go in and it's gonna like trap them or it's gonna fall or, or whatever, okay? So they're afraid of it. They're afraid to the point that they can't go in one without having a panic attack. And a panic attack, by the way, is when uh, they feel like they can't breathe, like they're choking, their heart rate goes up, they might pass out, they feel like they're going to die. All right, so they, they can't use an elevator. If they go in or near one, they'll, they'll have a panic attack and then they can't function for a while. And they certainly can't use the elevator. All right, so let's pretend this person's got a fear of elevators, all right? Um, what is the one thing I should not do with that person? How, what do you feel is like a bad idea to do with the person that's afraid of elevators? Force them to go in an elevator. Force them to go on an elevator, yes. That is uh, the obvious answer. That's what your intuition would say. So if you know this person's afraid of elevators, the last thing you wanna do is be like, let's go on the elevator. Because right? that person's gonna have a panic attack. Uh, they're gonna hate you forever. They won't trust you ever if you try to trick them into or get them to go uh, near an elevator. Uh, so our intuition tells us, oh, I'm afraid of elevators, avoid them. Like that's the intuitive um, uh, response. Okay, that's what we naturally feel is the best um, uh, option. Certainly if you're the one experiencing this, you don't wanna go near an elevator ever, right? Because they're, they're terrifying, even thinking about one might give you a, a panic attack. Okay, is that what you should do? That's what my intuition tells me. I should avoid it and I shouldn't ever force that person to deal with the trauma of trying to go near or even think about an elevator. Because that, that's mean, right? They're gonna suffer, they're gonna feel like they're gonna die, they're gonna be miserable. So my feelings are telling me, let's not expose them to this. Let's not uh, uh, cause them any more trauma or suffering than, than we need to. So then would like, the flip side be, oh, make them go into an elevator so they get over that fear? That would be, but does that feel like a uh, nice, natural solution? No, it, it, it usually goes against um, your intuitions as a human. I mean, when you know the information, it's much easier to be like, yeah, we need to expose them to elevators gradually to fix this. And, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. But uh, what we found is with most psychological concepts, our intuitions are totally wrong. They're actually wrong more than they are right. So even though it feels like you know the answer, like this is the right thing to do, it turns out it's the opposite. You're doing the worst thing you can do. Because uh, it turns out, if someone's fearful of elevators, the worst thing you can do to them is protect them from elevators. How does that make sense? It's gonna make it worse. It's gonna make it worse. How does it get worse? They're already afraid of elevators. It gives them the feeling that like, oh, it's fine to be afraid of elevators and they just don't get over 
and they don't, but it usually doesn't just stay with elevators. Here's what, here's what happened, or what, what do you got? Oh, I was gonna say, if, if you're like telling them to avoid it, then they're gonna start thinking there actually is a problem with elevators. Or they, they might, you might be confirming their fears, right. Um, but, I mean, if you're still using them, though, it's, it sounds a little contradictory. But here's, here's how, and we've only found this out through psychology and multiple experiments and trying different things. Uh, most commonly, when you have an extreme fear like this, like this is not normal. I mean, it happens to a lot of people, but, you know, out of 100 people, 20 of them aren't so afraid of elevators, they won't go on them. Some of them are. Um, what generally happens if somebody has a, an extreme fear of something, could be snakes or spiders or elevators or the ocean or whatever it might be, if they're so afraid of it that they start to avoid it, that becomes their response to anything that is troubling or traumatic or scary, all right? So if I'm so afraid of elevators I can't go there, I avoid them, right? And I spend my whole life trying to avoid elevators. So what happens next time something uncomfortable or scary or fearful happens? What's my brain gonna do? It's gonna avoid it, right? And what very quickly happens here is a very uh, negative, what's called a positive feedback loop. Um, what happens is, since they're afraid of, of elevators in this case, they avoid elevators. The next fear that comes up, whether it's speaking in public or it's driving or driving at night, I know a few people that are afraid of driving at night because uh, it's harder you know, to see and, and it's more dangerous and all that. They just start avoiding all these things uh, because they don't want to deal with the trauma or the anxiety. So it, it goes from just elevators. Uh, so if, like this is all the things you can do in a day, like it's a checkerboard. I'm like, okay, one thing I could do is uh, use an elevator, right? Well, I just took that one off the map because I'm too afraid to do it. And all they end up doing is increasingly eliminating things they can do. Oh, I'm afraid to drive at night because it's dangerous. Not gonna do that anymore. Take it off. And they keep doing this and doing this and doing this and doing this. And what's gonna happen eventually? They're very limited. They're gonna be extremely limited, right? To the point that they actually suffer, right? Because if I get to the point that I'm too afraid to drive at night or even too afraid to drive and I can't go in elevators, I'm afraid to talk in public and uh, I'm afraid to go to the grocery store because I might get sick, what, what's eventually gonna happen to me? It's gonna deteriorate, but wh where am I gonna go? If I'm afraid to go out in public and speak and have attention, what, what am I gonna do? You're just gonna be isolated, right? In your house, right? And you're, you're gonna miss out on all the opportunities, all the social action you need, interaction you need, your ability to work, your ability to function as a healthy human being. And what eventually happens, and this is not in every case, but if it can, uh, is you get to the point that you're agoraphobic. You're, a, you're afraid of everything. All things incite fear in you. Uh, because you've had all these instances where you've had a bad experience, you avoid them, and that becomes your uh, uh, default uh, reaction position, and your brain responds that way. So if you go do these things, you totally overreact and have a panic attack, and pretty soon, you're stuck in your house. And actually, you end up being afraid in your house, too, but where else are you going to go? Uh, so you're just stuck, fearful in your house, and you're locked in, all right? That's actually what happens if your strategy is to follow your intuition and avoid the thing that makes you... Uh, uh, anxious or terrified. So what the hell do you do then? Go you go against your intuition, right? So first of all, somebody has to have the idea of going against your intuition, and then you have to see how it actually works. Okay, so here's what you don't do if somebody's deathly afraid of an elevator. Grab them and drag them onto an elevator. That will make it profoundly worse. What could I do maybe to help somebody gradually face their fear and get over it. So let's, let's, let's think about this. What? What? We could first watch movies with elevators in it. Yes, you, you do it progressively, gradually, okay? And this is exactly what, actually behaviorists figured this out. Uh, the best way to address a fear is not to avoid it, because that actually makes the fear worse, and it actually increases the amount of fears you have. It's actually best to gradually, uh, voluntarily face the fear until you eventually do get over it. So yeah, you would go progressive like that. So if they're so scared of elevators they can't go near one, yeah, I can't bring them near one. Uh, first of all, they have to agree that they want to uh, get rid of this fear. And then you have to gradually uh, expose them to elevators. So you might start with like that, just thinking about an elevator, not even going near one, just thinking about one, right? Get them to the point that they're comfortable with that. Uh, and then maybe they, yeah, watch a, a video clip of an elevator a functional one that doesn't break, right? Uh, and then you, uh, you, you, uh, you increase it. Once they're used to that and they're, they're okay with that, then you go uh, to a, a store or a mall or whatever, and then you just look at an elevator, right? And then you say, 
how close to the elevator can you get, right? And they go to the point like right here, you know, and that's, that's the point that they can accept, all right? Eventually, they get used to that, and they're like, okay, I can go a step closer, right? And then you just progressively go until they're right next to it, and then one day they uh, uh, are able to hit the button, and one day they're able to look in the door as it opens. One day they're able to put a foot in the door. One day they're able to stand in it, and eventually it gets to the point that they're uh, using it like a normal human being. Why is that beneficial to them, by the way? Because it sounds like a long, uh, anxious, and annoying process. Why is that actually better for them? They're not as limited. Right, they're not as limited. Also, what's gonna happen when other fears start po popping up? Whether it's fear of speaking or driving or whatever. They'll have some reason. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll know how to face it, and they'll know that it actually works. And the only way we actually know this works is because somebody had the idea to try it. I forget the, the lady's name. She was the first person to, um, uh, come up with this theory. I totally forgot her name. I'll, I'll, I'll remember later. She's a behaviorist, but uh, she's the one that uh, figured out, oh, if you're deathly afraid of something, the worst thing you can do is avoid it. Uh, and actually, the best thing you can do is voluntarily face it uh, as much of it as you can until you, you get over it. All right, and the only reason we know that is because somebody had that idea. Then we practiced it. We're like, all right, you're afraid of elevators. Let's try this, right? And then they went through this whole series like, oh, sweet, it worked for this person. Does that mean that my theory is 100% foolproof and I should do it for everybody? No. no, what else am I gonna have to do once I figure out it works for one person? Try it, on Try it on other people, right. So they kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it for till the people went from tens to hundreds to thousands. Uh, and at that point, when you've got something that works for thousands of people, uh, that's generally uh, a valid theory. All right, will it work for every single person in the world? Not necessarily. But does it work for most people? Yes, uh, and you can actually prove that by having an idea about exposing them gradually to elevators and then doing it to a bunch of different people uh, and finding out that that actually is what works. And that's totally counterintuitive, right? You would not think, oh, the best thing to do for somebody who's scared of elevators is get them to go in an elevator, right? That's, that's not what you would think is the normal reaction. But your intuition's wrong, because your intuition doesn't know. All it knows is, I'm afraid of this thing, I don't wanna go near it. Right, so that's why it feels like a good idea to avoid it, but it turns out it's actually not the best thing to do. There's one more example I wanna tell you too. All right, let's say you've got a kid. Um, your kid is, uh, so you're a parent, right? Maybe you've got your partner with you, doesn't matter. We'll, we'll say parent, maybe you and your, your uh, spouse, and you get a kid. Um, let's say you're pretty creative as a person, and so is your spouse, your husband, your wife. Um, and your kid is born, and you're like, I hope he's creative too. What would be the best way to make sure that kid is creative like you? How should you raise the kid? Should you give them a whole bunch of strict rules? Should you let them do what they want? Should you dictate their day? Should you let them do uh, what they want, pursue what they want? What should you do? What's your intuition tell you is the best way to make that kid creative? Let them do what they want. Let them do what they want, right, exactly. Cool, so well, uh, the opposite of creativity is giving them a bunch of rules and restrictions, right? That's not creative, that's just doing the same thing over and over. So your intuition is gonna tell you, oh, I want my kid to be creative, uh, let them do what they want. Because what happens if you just tell a kid what to do and give them a bunch of rules and punish them all the time? Are they gonna try new things? No, no right, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna stop their uh, creativity. So that's how we should allow people to be creative, right? Just give them almost no rules or no rules so they can kind of do whatever they want and try new things and that would foster creativity, right? And that will lead to them being more creative as adults and more successful, right? Sound like a good strategy? It does actually sound like a good strategy. But it's not gonna work. Oh, but does it actually work? No. Oh, it turns out it doesn't. Why does this not work? If you let them do what they want, they're just gonna come lazy and not do anything at all. Close, okay, close. Okay, so here, here's what actually happens. Most people, when they think, oh, creative, obviously that's you being able to do what you want. You have to at some point uh, to be creative and come up with new ideas. So the uh, best way they believe, uh, they did believe anyway, to have creative, successful kids was to uh, 
not be disciplinary parents, but be compassionate parents. Uh, and even permissive. Meaning we don't really like give them rules, we don't force them to do things a certain way, we let them do what they want, okay? And what they found was, this does the opposite of what you want to achieve. This makes kids less creative. How on earth could that actually occur? <coughs> That could be it too, but it's actually even more complex than that. Here's how it goes. If I have a kid who uh, always likes to uh, scream and yell things and call people names, like that could be creative maybe. They're gonna be a songwriter or a poet or something like that. I should just let them do what they wanna do. What if I actually let my kid do that as they grow up? Are people gonna like being around them? No, they are not, right? They're gonna scream and yell and call people names and then uh, kids aren't gonna play with them. They're gonna avoid the hell out of them because who wants to be around that? Uh, adults aren't gonna help them out because that kid's annoying and nothing but a pain in their butt, so they're not going to help them out. So that kid just grows up kind of as uh, an antisocial person who doesn't get a lot of help, right? So if I grow up and I don't have friends and adults don't wanna help me out because I'm annoying uh, or I'm a nuisance, am I gonna learn like the basic things I need to to be successful as a person? like hold a job, go to school, not constantly be in the principal's office, um, uh, do things for the people. Am I gonna learn any of that? No, all I'm gonna learn how to do is do what I wanna do right now, and if you tell me to do anything else, too bad, I'm gonna do this anyway, all right? That's actually what happens. So what they actually found was, the more permissive and compassionate you are as a parent, uh, the worse your kid ends up becoming because of the factors that I just mentioned. <coughs> so it turns out, if you want to have a creative kid, or a successful kid, or both, uh, you actually have to mix in a fair amount of uh, rules and discipline and be consistent with them. How would I know that's the case? How would I know this ends in a result that, uh, where a kid becomes self-centered, um, immature, uh, unproductive, uh, doesn't have a lot of friends or success, to a kid that uh, does have those things, that does, is successful, that does have friends? Uh, that does get good opportunities. How would I know this doesn't work and that does? My intuition doesn't tell me that's the case. How would I know that's the right route or the best route and this is the uh, least effective route? Could I conduct an experiment? Yes. You could potentially. Is it kind of hard to conduct an experiment on somebody uh, as far as their parenting goes and their development across a lifetime? Yeah. That's pretty hard. To, that's pretty hard to determine. You could do it, you certainly could. You could get a bunch of families when they have kids and say, all right, so we need you to parent this way for their whole life, and then we're gonna come back in 20 years and see how your kids do it. Like, that's a longitudinal study, those exist. It's hard to do though. Would it be easier maybe to just go around and uh, ask parents how they were as they were parenting and see how happy uh, and successful their, uh, their adult children are? Would that also be a way to do it? Yeah. That would be, right. Um, and that's, that's largely what they did. Um, and that's how they determined this, too. They found out that um, if you are too compassionate and permissive as a parent, you end up kind of ruining your kid. Because they're going to become a, a selfish, indulgent uh, person that nobody likes. So they don't grow up with help or education or friends. And they're never able to be creative in the first place because they don't even learn the basic stuff they need to uh, to conduct uh, their life in a regular job have a relationship with somebody else, have a friendship with somebody else, they can't do any of that, all right? So that doesn't sound like the answer, but it actually is the answer. And the only way we know that is because of our ability to conduct experiments uh, and also to uh, assess uh, survey uh, data, all right? That is why we need um, experiments, and that is why we need to analyze uh, data, okay? And again, Another good marker of this is uh, single parenthood. Obviously, um, there are factors beyond your control as to whether or not you're born into a family uh, where you have a single parent, or maybe one of the parents was just a dropout deadbeat who just left the mother or, or the father or whatever. But um, they found that single parent households, the kids are way less successful for these exact reasons. All right, why do you think that might be? Given that you know this about kids, if you're too compassionate, permissive, you don't have enough rules, they end up becoming kind of a disaster. 
Whereas if you do have structure and rules and discipline, they actually become successful and creative. Why might single parent households do worse than parents, uh, households that have both parents present? Because they tend to be more compassionate. Okay, I wouldn't even say that's necessarily true. Usually, the single parents are more compassionate. It's hard to get discipline in the rules if you're by yourself. Exactly, that's exactly right. So there's multiple factors here. Um, so there's, there's some factors, uh, for example, if I'm a single parent, it's automatically harder because I have to make just as much money for the most part, but how many incomes does my household have? Oh, no. One instead of two, right? So it's, it's much more difficult. So I'm around less to even have rules and structure for my kid. So he's much more likely to become uh, this selfish, um, uh, unstructured, um, misbehaving person that nobody likes, all right? Also too, does anybody know if it's more common for uh, uh, to have a single mother or single father households? Single. single mother by a mile, right? That the, the dad is much less like, much more likely to to to, to fail, uh, which is a terrible thing. Um, uh, I can't remember the exact statistic. Um, I want to say it's upwards of like ninety percent of the time you have a single parent household, it's the mother, and then the father has left. Um, but um, who generally, if I took all the males and females in the world? Who's generally more compassionate? Males or females? Females generally, yeah. Uh, and, and they are, I think it's about a 70 to 30 ratio. If I took any random male and any random female in the world and I had to bet on who was more uh, compassionate, 70% of the time it's the female. So 30% of the time, yeah, the, the, the guy actually might be more compassionate, but it's, it's more, more likely it's the uh, uh, female. Okay, so I've got these uh, super compassionate uh, uh, single parents, uh, more, more of them women, but not all of them. Um, are they more likely to be strict or more likely to be understanding and, and have less rules if they're more compassionate? They're gonna have less, uh, right, they're gonna be, they're be more likely to uh, have less rules, less structure. So what they found uh, happens in single parent households is because the parent's not there and because generally speaking, it's, it's usually like a mother or a grandma or an aunt or something, they're more compassionate, the kids end up doing worse and when I say doing worse, I mean worse in every category. Uh, whether that means dropping out of high school, um, whether that means going to prison, whether that means uh, having a low income, whether that means having bad relationships, having bad friendships, uh, dying at a much earlier age, uh, being less healthy overall. Every single marker you can use, single parent households do worse uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, because either there's not two parents there to share the load or, um, there's not enough actual discipline uh, in the household. So you would think that all of the nicest, most compassionate, helpful kids would come out of compassionate households, but that's actually the opposite of the case. They actually uh, uh, come out of the households with two parents that are more strict, because uh, that you actually teach your kid to care about other people, not just be a selfish, uh, indulgent uh, piece of crap, essentially. All right, so that was a really, really long, drawn out explanation, but uh, hopefully that gives you an idea as to why we need this, all right? Because usually the things that we think will make things better, they make it worse. Uh, and it takes a long time uh, through experimentation or analyzing data to, to actually find out, oh, it's not actually this thing that we thought it was, it's something totally different uh, that actually fixes the problem or makes it better. Uh, how come people usually tell us to follow our gut Because uh, they're wrong. That's what people think. <laughs> I'm serious, like, nah, that sounds mean and whatnot and dismissive, but uh, your gut is wrong more than it's right. And in fact, they've tested this. Uh, how can I test out if my gut is wrong or right most of the time? How can I determine if my gut is actually a good marker? Because they've actually done this, by the way. They did this for prayer, too. Okay, I don't know the numbers for prayer. I know it was done, but I know that they did this for uh, intuition, or that gut feeling you're talking about. So here's what they did. They took a whole bunch of people and they would give them um, scenarios where uh, there was a, a, an answer. Like, it could be like this. It could be like uh, the, the scenario we just got here, which is, hey, uh, how do you make your kid more creative? Give them more rules or m let them do more things they want, right? So they'd let them choose. So they had uh, one group uh, make guesses based on their gut. Uh, they had other groups uh, based on experimental and scientific data. 
and they had one group that where they just, they just didn't, didn't tell them to uh, do anything specific. They just said, answer these questions. They didn't tell them only to use their gut or only to use data. They just said, use whatever you want. All right, so use whatever. Guess which group was uh, right the most frequently? It was correct most of the time, where its answers um, were generally uh, true or correct. Okay, here, let me do a number. So this is one, this is two, this is three. One, two, or three, most right. Two, two right. What do you think was the uh, least correct? One. one was the least correct, unfortunately. In fact, they found out that um, your gut is actually correct less times than just randomly picking. So if I said, is it this option or this option, you just randomly chose, that's about the same chance as um, you following your gut. It's just a random choice. All right, so you should have an informed decision. If you're ever gonna do something, uh, you should do your best to base it on uh, things that we know about human beings and human behavior uh, scientifically. Because it's just more accurate, that's all it is. This gut feeling about following your, your heart, and your feelings and all that, that's all it is, guys, it's a feeling. It doesn't actually know if that's true or not. And in fact, we found out a lot of times it's the opposite of what you feel is true uh, than what is actually true. So again, like if you wanna make your kid more creative, the worst thing you can do is give them no rules, which is the opposite of what most people would think going in, right? Uh, if you want to uh, help somebody get over a fear, the worst thing you can do is have them avoid that fear, which is what we would have thought was the right answer. Uh, so that's why we use these experiments. Okay, um, let's take a break. I've been talking for a long time. Now let's actually talk about um, what an experiment entails and what makes them so much more reliable than uh, our intuition. So the purpose is, we want to find out what the, uh, not what the right answer is, but what the best answer is, or the best chance of improving things by reducing suffering, or however you want to phrase it. Uh, experiments, there are several ways you can do this. So um, you can either conduct an experiment yourself, like you have an idea, like, oh, I think this is what caused people to be depressed. So we can conduct an experiment to find out. Uh, or you can analyze the data. So let's go over the types of experiments, and we'll talk about what an experiment entails. So uh, experiments. There are quite a few uh, you can use. Uh, you can use a uh, longitudinal study. That one's pretty uh, simple. That one is where you follow one, a person or a group over many weeks or months or years, and you check in every once in a while uh, to see how things are going as far as like what their happiness is, what, how their health is, how their uh, life is going, whatever markers you're looking for, uh, you would check in every once in a while. So those are the ones where you like say, uh, if I wanted to see if a certain parenting technique worked better than another, as far as producing a kid that is more uh, uh, successful, like maybe they make more money or they have, they're happier uh, in life, like if you ask them about it and they rate it, uh, that's when you would go in to new parents and be like, okay, so we want you to parent this way. Uh, and they would parent that way, hopefully, and you would just check in every one, two, three, four, five years, whatever, and see how the kid's doing. Like, oh, are they ha generally happy? Like, you know, if you ask them to give a questionnaire, uh, do they have a lot of friends? Are they successful? Uh, uh, do they have problems making friends? Like, things like that, you would check in. That's a longitudinal study. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, longitudinal, long time, so you just check in every once in a while. Uh, those are effective, um, and they have, uh, there's a, the longest running study ever has been going for like 80 years or something like that. Um, and I think it's 80 years. It's the happiness study. And they're, they're trying to figure out the factors that make people the happiest. Um, and they've actually found out that it's um, uh, not even some of the things you would think. It's mostly having connections with other people, like relationships. So like having a spouse, uh, having a family, uh, and having friends generally make you happiest across the lifetime. And, cause you to live longer. Uh, but they can only do that if they watch a whole bunch of people uh, through their entire lives. So the people that started the experiment, they've been dead a long time, uh, but the people have kept checking in with the, uh, uh, the kids who were kids 80 years ago and now are in their 80s. Uh, they've kept checking in with them every like five years or whatever it is they, they do the check in. All right, another one is a cross-sectional study. Cross-sectional. This is more about like choosing a specific demographic or, or point in time. So 
if I wanted to find out how President Trump being president affects high schoolers, would I ask somebody who's 34? No, Why not? They aren't in high school. Were they ever in high school when Trump was in office? No, they haven't been. So what age range could I pick then? Just 18? How long has he been in office? Yeah, almost four years. So you could potentially choose anybody from age like roughly 14. That's about how old you are when you're a freshman. Uh, till up to like at this point like 22 or so. Because those were people that were all in high school uh, during his uh, tenure as president. Right? So that would be a cross-sectional study. That would be if I wanted to find out uh, how high schoolers felt about him being in office or whatever, uh, I would choose um, 14 to 22 year olds. And why did I choose that group? Because they've been in high school since he's been in office. Right, exactly. That's cross-sectional. Um, what's another example of cross-sectional? If I wanted to find out what age you are the most fulfilled or happy, would I just ask any random person? What would I do, do you think? If I wanted to find out which age range you're the most fulfilled or happy, generally speaking, in your lifetime, would I just ask any random person? No, what would I do? Yeah, you would find specific age ranges and just ask those people and keep the data there, right? So you use a cross-sectional. So you, I don't know, you could use like five-year periods. You could be like, all right, let's ask all the people aged uh, uh, 18 to 23, and then 24 to 29, and then 30 to 34, all the way down to see which answers uh, for which group uh, are the happiest or, or most fulfilled or, or whatever, right? So that, that's an example of cross-sectional. So you're choosing a specific uh, age group or type of person and asking them specifically. Does that make sense? All right, and there are uses for that, right? Because you feel different ways uh, at different points in your life, so this is helpful for figuring that out. All right, you've also got, this one's the easiest, naturalistic observation. That's when uh, you want to see how people behave, but you don't want to impact how they behave, so you just watch them. You just creep on them, essentially. Uh, and you don't want to interfere with their lives at all. So uh, we do this with animals all the time. Uh, we. Uh, you guys ever heard of Jane Goodall? Yes. No? Oh my goodness. All right, well, in the 70s, uh, she revolutionized uh, our understanding of not just uh, ourselves, um, but she did it by observing chimpanzees and noticing a lot of similar behaviors between chimpanzees and us. She basically like stayed out in the jungle for like over 10 years in the 70s. Um, I think National Geographic paid for it, uh, and she had a photographer who she ended up marrying. Um, and then uh, she just basically hung out there and observed these uh, chimpanzees and what they did and how they behaved for like over a decade. Um, that's naturalistic observation, all right? So she's hypothetically, I mean, I'm sure at some point she ran into chimpanzees and affected something, but for the most part, she's just watching from a distance. Is she going in and messing with the chimpanzees? No, that's, that's a naturalistic observation. So how, how, could I, uh, how could I use a naturalistic observation of uh, you guys at school? If I wanted to study your guys' behaviors at school, what could I do? You like Yeah, you could have. I could use anybody. I could creep, yeah. But I, I would obviously I wouldn't do because I can't be everywhere. I would want to have like uh, multiple people that are just noting what what high schoolers do generally throughout the day, right? And then that would be natural school observation, All right? So they're not interfering with your lives; they're just kind of seeing what you guys do generally across the day, All right? Uh, we've also got surveys. This is where, if I'm trying to figure something out, like how happy you are, or how fulfilled you are, or how often you're upset, and you know, whatever, uh, I just use a survey. So I give you a bunch of questions, I give you some options, and I give it to you. What's really important here, though, is that the results are anonymous, meaning you don't put your name on it. You might have your age there, uh, or your age range, but I won't have you put your name. Why is it super important that I make it, keep the results anonymous? So you're more realistic with your actual answers. Yes, exactly. Am I more or less likely to lie on a questionnaire if the person knows what my answers are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm way more likely to lie, why? Because you 
You want people to think better of you, exactly. Like, you're not going to answer like, oh, I'm actually always miserable, or you're less likely to, if I know the answer you're given. But if it's anonymous, you're much less likely to lie because you're not worried about it being reflected back on you. All right, so if you're ever using surveys, got to be anonymous. All right, now you, you can use ages and gender and things like that, but you don't want to ever identify the person because they're much more likely to lie about the results. So they're going to answer dishonestly because nobody wants to look bad. Maybe you're a particularly authentic person and maybe you would be generally honest, but you're, you're going to be much more honest if you know no one's going to know exactly what you put. All right, so surveys work. All right, I know that's not an experiment per se, uh, but that's definitely analyzing data. All right, so both, all of these could be an experiment. You could intentionally design it, or you could just gather information. Uh, but either way, you can generally find an answer. All right, so that's uh, more of a data. Um, there's six, I think. Um, i trying to remember the other ones. Correlation study. That is one where you're trying to figure out if two things come together or not. So here's what I mean by that. Um, do you think someone who is happy, like they rate themselves as happy? Like you say one to 10, 10 being the most happy, one being the least happy, how happy are you? This person's a nine. What could I also probably say about this person that would be uh, have an also high rating? Let me give you an example. Uh, do you think somebody who is very happy all the time, do you think they smile more than somebody who's unhappy in a day? Yeah. Yeah. Probably, right. So if I said scale 1 to 10 how happy you are and scale 1 to 10 how many times do you smile a day, do you think the uh, number is going to be somewhat similar? Mm -hmm. they, they probably are, right. Smiles a day. Uh, that might be like a 7, 8, or 9, or whatever it might be. All right. <clears throat> Those two things are correlated, meaning... I can actually count these, put them onto a, um, a graph, and, and see if they both go up or both go down together or if they do the opposite. All right, so here's what I mean by that. Um, if they're correlated, they usually come together, right? If somebody who's happy smiles more often, right? Right? Okay. But does being happy cause you to smile? Can you only smile when you're happy? No. no. Can you smile when you're unhappy? Yes. Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, just because you are happy, does that mean that you're going to smile all the time? <laughs> Not necessarily. Right. So just because I have one, do I have to have the other? Does, does one cause the other? Does smiling cause me to be happy? Not necessarily, although it kind of does a little bit, but we'll talk about that later. It's called uh, 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 the feedback tank. I forgot the term. Facial feedback? I forget the actual term. But there's a term like the way you move your face muscles, like if you frown, it'll actually slowly make your mood a little bit worse because your body thinks you're in a bad mood. Uh, or if you smile a lot, it'll actually improve your mood a little bit because your body thinks that you're happy. But they don't really cause one another. I can smile and not be happy, but I can also be happy and not smile. Right? We can agree on that? Okay. So those would be correlated. That means they usually come together. But do they have to come together? No, they don't have to. Okay. Both these usually do go up or down together, though. Like, if I'm very unhappy, if I scored a one, how many times a day do you think I smile? Not very many, right? One, two, three, maybe, you know, tops. So that would be a, a, a positive correlation. I Meaning they both go up together, or they both go down together. All right? What would be a negative correlation, then, do you think? If positive means they both go up together, or they both go down, what would a negative be? One goes up, the other goes down. Yeah, exactly. All right, so things that are negatively correlated. All right, how about things that are negatively correlated? We could stick to happiness, all right? So let's say happiness. Somebody scored a nine on happiness. You ask one to 10, what are you happy? Nine. What's likely to be low because that person's happy? What? What? I, don't even know, I hear a voice, but it's so faint. Frowning. Frowning. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Frowning. Probably if they're happy all day, they're not going to be frowning very often, right? Or crying. You can use anything that's kind of the opposite of happiness. 
uh, they're generally not going to be uh, very many, happen very frequently. What happens though if I'm frowning a lot? Am I, pro am I happy? No. Probably not. All right, so if I happen to have a person that fills out that they frown a lot, 10 times a day, what's their happiness probably going to be? Higher or lower? lower. Probably going to be lower. Is it necessarily going to happen? No, but it most likely is, and it usually does, right? So uh, do these both go up together? No. 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 What happens? When one goes up, yeah, the other goes down, right? That's a negative correlation, uh, and, and we can see that things are correlated. One thing people confuse all the time is that because things are correlated, they cause one another. And that's not the same thing. All right, here's an example. Um, we know that uh, if you take, uh, you guys all do state tests in schools and then they rank your school on how you score. Um, most schools that perform poorly, uh, that's usually correlated with, uh, with uh, low school funding. So what that means is usually schools that do bad, they have less money going to the school. So they have less teachers. Uh, that's a big problem because if I have a class of 50 of you, I'm not, you're not going to learn nearly as well as if I have a class of 20 of you because uh, you'll have a much better uh, connection with these instructor. I'll know you better and, and I can help uh, uh, teach you better that way. Um, but um, just because a school has more or less money available, does that automatically improve student performance? Not necessarily, because there are some really low-funded schools that perform well, and there are also some really well-funded schools that perform terrible. Uh, wait, I think I said the wrong thing. There are some really low-funded schools that perform well, and some very low High-funded high schools that perform poorly. There we go, that's what I'm trying to say. Is it common? No, but it's, but it's there. So would you say that if they, one causes the other? No, because there are some examples of where uh, it doesn't, they don't come together or they don't do the opposite. Because again, we have some schools with low funds, they do well. Clearly the funding's not the sole cause there, right? <coughs> we have some schools that get a bunch of money, they do terrible. Clearly the funding is not the only cause there. Might be one of them, but it's not the only cause. All right, so don't confuse that. Just because two things usually come together or they usually do the opposite doesn't mean they cause one another necessarily. Does that make sense? All right, that's a big one to understand. Uh, that correlation does not prove causation. That's a big one for um, uh, the AP test. All right, so understand that difference. All right, so those are my types. Uh, I think there's six, though. Case, Which, studies. case studies, thank you. Case studies. That's where I just follow an individual or a group, uh, and I have their single story, uh, and I hope that that can tell me something about all human beings. Those are generally unreliable because if something happens to one person, it doesn't mean it'll happen to every other person. But sometimes you don't have a choice. For example, um, if I'm trying to analyze what happens uh, when I'm trying to think of an example, it's hard to think of actually. When things are really rare, like identical twins, or maybe you have like a brain tumor, or maybe you have some sort of genetic uh, mutation, there's not a whole lot of people you can look at to see uh, what the problem might be or how to fix or make things better. So that's kind of all you have to go off of is, oh, well, there's only like five people that have this condition in the entire world, so I kind of just have to look at this person and see what helps them and hope that that also means it'll help other people too. Um, so case studies aren't that reliable, but sometimes that's all you have, especially for really rare, like genetic abnormalities or really rare circumstances, uh, things like that. Sometimes all you can do is look at the person and say, well, this helped you, so hopefully we can use that information and it'll help other people too. It'd be way more reliable if you could do it to a thousand people and it worked for 99% of them, be like, okay, this probably works for everybody. Uh, but case studies, sometimes you have to use. All right, those are case studies, okay. So, an experiment. If I go to conduct one, it's not just random. There's actually like a procedure uh, you have to use. So there's several things you have to uh, assess. They're called variables. Um, first, an independent variable. And second is a dependent 
independent variable. Pretty easy to understand, I think. The independent variable is the thing you're trying to figure out. Meaning, if I think that um, smiling more in a day will make you happier, that's the independent variable. Okay, so you could actually run an experiment on this. You could take, I don't know, a thousand people, and you could be like, all right, we're gonna set your phone so that every 15 minutes from 12 o'clock till two o'clock, you force yourself to smile. All right, and they would do that you know, every day for whatever, and they would rate how happy they are. All right, that's your independent variable. You're trying to see if forcing people to smile makes them happier. All right, the dependent variable is uh, how you would measure that. So the independent variable is what you're trying to uh, factor, trying to prove or disprove. And again, in my smiling example, I'm trying to see if forcing people to smile makes them happier. And how would I know if smiling makes them happier? How would I get the results? Because that's what the dependent variable is. Like, does smiling make me happier? So how would I know if it did or it didn't? What could I do to these, uh, these people who I'm testing this on? You got one? Your hand flinched. Yeah, you could like one to ten. How happy are you at, at two o'clock when you've done all of your smiles, all of your required smiles for the day or whatever, right? So in this case, the dependent variable would be uh, uh, the uh, the happiness rating. All right. So again, independent independent variable is what you're trying to figure out. Like, does this change something? And the dependent variable is uh, what is changed essentially. So this is. Does this change something? This is, was something actually changed? So let's use a different example that's probably more clear. Um, what if I want to help people uh, get better at studying? What's something I could try to figure out? So if I want you guys to do better on quizzes, how could I find what makes you guys perform better on quizzes or not? Give me some examples of things you can do to make your quiz grades go up, besides cheating. Okay, setting flashcards. Good. I think that was example. <coughs> All right. So if I want to see if studying with flashcards makes your test scores better, what's my independent variable? What am I trying to see affects another thing? Flashcards. Studying with flashcards. Right. So flashcard use. Right. That's my independent variable. So how do I know if the flashcard makes it better or not? What do I have to look at at the end of the results? The results, yeah, the quiz results. Are the dependent variable. All right, so the independent is always the thing that affects the other, or at least you're trying to see if it affects it or not. All right, so how would I know then if flashcard use actually uh, improved uh, your guys' performance? How could I know that? Test scores. Test scores, okay, I'm gonna be a little more organized than that. Yeah, I will look at the scores, but how do I know if the flashcards made them better or not. You can have another group where they don't use flashcards. Exactly. So I can make one group that uses the flashcards and one group of you that doesn't use them. Mm -hmm. All right? That's where I start getting into the uh, uh, specifics here. Okay. So I have my independent variable, the flashcards. My dependent variable, the quiz results. But how would I know if it helped? I could know by splitting you guys up. All right? Half of you would use flashcards and half of you would do nothing. Right? You would just read your notes or listen or whatever the hell is it you do, okay? So, I got two groups. I've got the experimental group, and I've got the uh, control group. Um, the experimental group is the one that I want them to use the independent variable, and the control group is the one that I do not want to, because I want to know uh, if they perform better or worse than um, the uh, people with the flashcards. So, which group, experimental or control, are gonna have flashcards? Experimental. experimental, right. So, uh, the thing that I'm trying to figure out, that's always the experimental group, right? It'd be the same thing as a medicine. Like, if I wanted to figure out, oh, does this caffeine pill make you perform better on tests? The group that I gave the caffeine pill to would be the uh, experimental group, all right? So the control group, then, is the uh, no flashcards. And what would tell me if the flashcards uh, helped out or not? In who? In what group? 
Yeah, I would, I would look at the two different uh, grades, yeah. So I would see if, oh, uh, were they higher percentage or lower or roughly the same? That's what I'd be trying to assess. Okay, so let's say um, we do that this week. Half you do flashcards, half you don't. Uh, this group gets a, an 83% and this group gets a 71%. Did flashcards improve their score? Yes. yes. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. It's just one experiment. It is one time with 30 people. What if I just so happen to choose the 15 or so of you that are a little bit smarter than the other 15 or so? Is that a possibility? Yes. It is. So how would I, what would be a better way of me knowing if this is actually true or not? If it actually makes you better or not? Okay, that's why I would want to make the groups random for sure. Uh, but would I just run the test once? No, I would do it multiple times, right? Uh, and preferably, I do with other classes, too. So if I'm doing this in four different classes, like 10 times across the year, I've got 40 uh, experiment results, I'm going to know, more or less, if the flashcards help or not. Would one instance in one class prove it? No, it, it might. But if I do it to multiple classes, multiple times, and all the results, or almost all the results, are like this, then I know... What do I know? If almost all the results from 40 experiments look like this, what do I know? Flashcards help, right. So that's how I would uh, root that out. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the reason why you uh, have multiple experiments. Uh, it's also why you randomly select people. Um, actually, wait, we didn't really talk about that. Why would I randomly select who's in which group? Why would I randomly select not choose? Like, okay, you go flashcard, you don't go flashcard. You, why, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I choose people? Because uh, it prevents a bias. Yeah, bias. yeah. What if I, on purpose or not, just start putting the people I like better in one group, um, or the people that are a little smarter in one group, or, or whatever? Right. That would be a problem. So I want it to be random. I want just a, a like to put your names in a hat and just like pick, or have a computer a program just shuffle you and put you into the groups. That way, I have no impact on what group you're in, all right? Um, I can tell you this, though. There's also a problem. If I want to see how good quiz scores are or, or how intelligent you guys are, why is it bad for me to use you as just you as a class? Let's say I'm trying to uh, figure out what the average IQ intelligence is of, uh, of people your age, all right? And what if I just ran a test on you guys and, and scored you? Why is that not a good indicator? Yeah, okay, cool. So because you're an AP class, uh, you're probably, you're certainly more motivated. You all chose this class to be here. And generally speaking, AP classes, smarter students ch tend to take those classes. So you guys would not be a good uh, mix or a good idea of what the average intelligence is uh, for someone your age. Also, did you notice anything else about this room that's a little lopsided? That painting? Besides the painting. Yeah, the guy to girl ratio here is like 10 to 1 or something like that. It's really, really lopsided, right? So that might throw me off too. <coughs> so that's why if I'm actually trying to figure out what your guys' age group IQ is, I would not just use this class because it's a small number. Uh, you're a very specific class that may be, uh, you know, depending on what class it is, they might be a smarter class or a less intelligent class. Uh, and then I would also want a roughly equal number of males and females too. Because uh, if I just choose one AP class of like 90% uh, females, that is not going to be an accurate um, uh, intelligence picture compared to everybody else uh, at your age. All right, so that's why all these things have to be random. I can't just choose a class. I'd have to randomly choose from the entire school uh, in your age group. All right, and then I'd have to also uh, randomly put you into these groups because I don't want to accidentally put people I like more in this class, in this one, or people that are uh, smarter in this group or whatever. I want it to be as unbiased uh, and unknown as possible. So that's why if I want to actually give a test about your intelligence or personality or whatever, I would draw students from the entire school and I would randomly put them into groups uh, so I don't know who's going where. So that way, all bias uh, and what are called confounding variables are taken out. So we'll probably call it with that because there's only like two minutes left. So we'll pick up tomorrow on confounding variables
There's not much to say after that, so it'll go pretty quickly. We left off on confounding variables, I think? Yes. Okay. So for an experiment, obviously we talked about the types. Um, you got the independent variable and the dependent variable. Which is which is which? What are they? What's the independent variable in an experiment? When you're trying to prove or like factor or disappear. Yeah, you're trying to see if it's a factor or not, if it affects something else. Right? So uh, whatever factor you're analyzing here. So like could be flash card use or it could be caffeine consumption, like whatever you're trying to study. That's the thing. You're trying to see if that makes an impact on um, something. And then what's the dependent variable then? Yeah, what, what is or is an impact of the result? In the case of the flashcards, it's the quiz. In the case of like, oh, does uh, caffeine consumption improve test scores? It'd be the test scores again. It's whatever result you're looking for. Uh, whatever the factor impacts or doesn't impact. Right, and that's what you, you would find out to measure. So uh, if we all did the um, flashcard example, and like I gave a whole bunch of tests and you know, half the class used flashcards, half didn't. I did it for like 40 classes for a bunch of different quizzes, uh, and all the quizzes came out the same. What would that tell me about flashcard use? Well, if I said if all the results came out the same, like there was no big difference in the test results between the two groups, what would that tell me? Flashcards didn't help in this case, most likely. Exactly. Okay, cool. Then we talked about the random assignment and all that. So we talked about the experimental group, right? Right? Mm -hmm. And the control group. All right, so in the flashcard example, what's the experimental group? The ones that use the flashcards. Once the flashcards, yes. And then um, the control group will be? The ones that don't. The ones that don't, right. So why do I need a control group, by the way? Because I need to have both of these. To see the difference. Yeah, to see the difference. Like if there was a change between the two, right? So that's, and these would be the non flashcard users. All right, cool. Um, so, Confounding variables are what we're talking about. What else did we talk about? Talk about one other thing too. Or was it just the confounding variables that I was going to talk about? Okay. Oh, control variables. That was the other thing. All right. So, uh, confounding variables are anything that could screw up your results. So, do you think I want uh, this? Was what would make my findings reliable or not? Um, so do you think I want a lot or a little of these confounding variables? You want none of them preferably, or at least whatever the lowest amount you can have. All right, so let's try to think of some. Let's say I did my test with just you guys for one quiz. Um, and we had my half you in flashcards, half you didn't, uh, and I get the results. Let's say it comes out the way I expect. Like yesterday, we had 81% for this group and 73% uh, for this group. That's what I expect, roughly. And this group does better, noticeably better, full letter grade. What could potentially mislead me to think that this one test shows that the flashcards uh, made that group perform better? What could mislead me? What, what, what could explain this being higher than this besides the flashcards? The 81% could be like the ones that take the easy classes and usually... Yeah, I, I could have randomly, on accident or intentionally, selected half of the class that's just a little bit smarter or more motivated, like with or without flashcards, right? That could be, so one factor could be, a confounding variable could be uh, intelligence, all right? Uh, or even personality, because those of you that are more motivated to study are going to likely do better in a class like this, which is a lot of learning information and kind of memorizing and using it. So intelligence, personality could definitely uh, uh, screw that up. What else could screw up my results and mislead me to think the flashcards did it when maybe they didn't? Like the ratio of girls to boys? Okay, gender could, yeah, certainly. All right, oh, I forgot to give you guys money for that. So who got my last three for these? Who got the intelligence one? Is you, I know you got one, who got, the, oh no, I just said the personality one. All right. All right. Okay, what else? What else could screw up the result to make me think that that group did better up for the flashcards? Age. What? Age. Age, yeah. In this case, it's going to be pretty much the same. But yes, you're right. Uh, well, that's not true. It could be, because there is an age range, because this is juniors and seniors. All right, fair enough. Age could be. Certainly in other experiments that aren't limited to like one class, age could definitely be a factor. Absolutely. Like if I was doing a broad intelligence um, test, 
and I gave you guys the same test that I gave a bunch of uh, uh, people that were my age, uh, obviously that's going to be a, uh, a confounding variable because you guys, just because you've been on the earth less time, know less than a bunch of 30 year olds most likely. All right, so that wouldn't be a fair, but the flashcards would have little impact on that. All right, give me a couple more. Did you hand this to whoever it goes to? Oh, she's right there, actually. Jack Boyce, thanks. What, um, uh, what else could screw the results and make me think that this group did better because of flashcards, even though they didn't? Think about anything that can make you do better or worse on a test, anything at all, that maybe I don't know as your teacher. Sleep. Absolutely. <laughs> what were you going to say, though? Sorry. What? Yeah, you could have cheated. Exactly. Uh, you could have cheated. Um, you could uh, lack sleep. Does lacking sleep make you perform better or worse? worse? Worse across the board in every single measure. Like, as far as your ability to recall information, remember it, the speed at which you can uh, write and, and, and use your, your own brain power, uh, sleep negatively impacts that uh, if you miss it. Okay. Um, what else, baby? What might make you perform worse on a test? If or better? Hungry. What? Oh, that's true too, yeah. Okay, so you could be lacking some sort of need, like a, a hunger, for example. Yeah, you're gonna be distracted if you're like lacking food, or maybe just you lack enough food to even be uh, healthy. So that's another one. Are you gonna be uh, worse or uh, perform worse or perform better if you're sick? Worse, worse absolutely, yeah, because all these things are gonna suffer. Right, so sickness could, I think you get the idea, a lot of these things. Uh, could. Some people actually just do better on tests than others, even though their intelligence is the same. Because one person's personality is uh, more anxious, so they get like test anxiety, so they panic, they forget things that they actually know, uh, whereas the person who isn't uh, uh, as neurotic or anxious, they can easily recall the stuff more uh, than the other person, even if they're the same intelligence. Right, so these are all factors that could screw it up. All right, so why? This can happen at any point. And do I know any of these things about you guys? Except for maybe like your gender and your age. Do I like know all of these about you? No, no right, I, I don't really know. They, they could screw up the results and I wouldn't even know. I, I could accidentally uh, pick in half the class that's more or less of one of these things and could make it look like the flashcards are responsible when maybe they are not. So how could I fix this? How could I make sure that these don't impact my results as much or maybe at all? What could I do? Have a larger sample. Yeah, that's where you want the larger sample size. So now I wouldn't just do one test with you guys. I would do a bunch of tests, all right? And I would uh, want to have multiple classes, so it's not just you guys uh, as a sample set. So that's where sample size comes into play. Because if I, if I only have 30 of you on one test, any of these things could screw the results up. But if I tested you guys like 50 times, and I did it with like 50 other classes, I'd have like data sets in the thousands. I would know for a fact that even if these are going on a little bit, just the sheer volume of people that I, I looked at and, and data that I assessed, these things are gonna trickle out on their own. Because this is, these things are true in every class. But if I look at hundreds or thousands of people in classes, uh, these things kind of just naturally uh, filter out and don't impact the result, right? And you know that. If I were to give you a test on a day when you were really tired, didn't sleep a lot because maybe you had some family or relationship problems or whatever, like you're gonna do worse on the test. Does that mean that's how smart you are? No, that's just that one day. But if I test you every single day for like four years, am I gonna get a pretty good accurate picture of how you actually are as far as how intelligent you are or whatever? Yeah, because those days when these affect you negatively, they just get thrown into the data and they're so minuscule that they just get weeded out uh, based on your average score. All right, that's why we want large sample sizes. So anytime you see a study where the sample size is small, really, really, really consider that those results might have a lot of confounding variables. That's why if you're gonna go and tell anybody, oh, well, this study said that this is the right answer, or this is what affects it, well, look at the study. Is it a small study? Like, what was the sample size? What were the parameters? Any good study's got huge sample sizes, or, they're what called meta-analyses. They take a whole bunch of studies done by different people and put them all together to look at the data. And those are way more reliable, all right? So that's why we need this, because we want to get rid of these variables. Because again, we want to know 
that my test that showed flashcards make you do better on quizzes is actually true, right? What's the threat if I'm wrong? What if I run with these results and I tell you all the flashcards magically make your test scores better and they don't? What's the problem? It's not going to be accurate. Yeah, it's not going to be accurate. Like, what if they actually make you do worse? Like, and I give you the total opposite uh, advice that is actually helpful. It could actually make your lives worse, right? Just like we talked about the other day with the, um, uh, with the parenting or the uh, fear of elevators or anything. Like, if you don't have the right information, you could actually make your life worse without knowing it. You would think you're making your life better, uh, but you wouldn't know it, right? Because again, what does our intuition tell us about um, things that we're afraid of or things that other people are afraid of? Avoid them, right. But it turns out that that's actually the worst thing you can do. So you go your whole life and think that's exactly what you're supposed to do. Like, oh, I don't want to put that person under pressure or traumatize them or myself or whatever. And you think they're helping them, but really you're actually making their life worse uh, and as far as how they can deal with their fears. All right, that's why we need experiments, and that's why we want to eliminate these confounding variables. Uh, and it's pretty easy to come up. Like, this list right here alone can allow you to, to analyze any experiment uh, that has a small sample size. And you'll probably have to do that for the AP test. One of your FRQs will certainly be either you making or analyzing an experiment. So that's what you'll have to do. They'll ask, like, oh, what might be some confounding variables or problems with these results? So you have to be looking at, oh, look, the sample size is too small. Uh, there's a bunch of confounding variables that could screw up the results and make you think that's the answer, but it's not. Uh, and then you have to tell them how to get a good answer. All right. <clears throat> so if I have a good sample size, like I randomly selected the people and I randomly split them up in these two groups and I had hundreds or thousands of uh, tests that I looked at, that's when we would know our experiment, the results, or what we call statistically significant. It basically just means the test is valid. I have almost certainly gotten rid of all these confounding variables that could screw up my results. All right, so if I got a big sample size, if I've randomly selected and assigned, uh, and I've probably successfully gotten rid of most or all of the confounding variables, that's how I know it's statistically significant. It actually did and showed something. All right, <clears throat> so. If I want to look at the data, because that's what I'm doing, right? I'm looking at all the scores you guys did, and I'm putting them uh, somewhere where I can see them on a graph uh, or whatever. Now we're going to talk about those graphs and, and what those mean, because you will have to be able to look at those as well. All right. That's why I was able to kind of skip over the first notebook page or two, because it's just an overview of psych. But this stuff you have to know, because you have to know what you're looking at, and you have to know what's uh, good or bad or faulty or correct about a study. All right, so confounding. Let's look at the actual data. All right, so let's say I am looking at grades, all right? There's a couple different things I can do. Uh, there's two real graphs we would use um, in this class to analyze um, if things are uh, related or not, if, they're, if the factors are uh, actually impacting the result. So the first one is, is basically a bar graph. What was that one called? You got any of you guys remember? Histogram. Histogram, nice. Who had that one? Is that you? Well done. Histogram. Okay, so here's an example of two histograms. Okay, so here is the, um, how would I do this? I would have the grades down here. So histogram. So this would be the grades that you all got. And this would be the number of people that got those grades. So we'll say 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 grades. <coughs> A, B, C, D, E uh, people. OK, it could be the exact same for this one. I'm making two, and I'll tell you why in a second. All right, they're not going to be perfectly proportional, but you'll live. Did I put E? <laughs> nice, at least I caught it. Now that I think about it, why don't we have an E? Whatever. I guess fail sounds nice instead of an E. E lost. All right. So, I'm gonna have two here. Uh, why do I have two graphs for the, for the flashcard experiment? Yeah, exactly. One for the experimental group, one for the control in this case, because we're only looking at those two. So this would be the experimental group, 
<coughs> right, the ones with the flashcards, and this would be the uh, control group, the uh, non-flashcards. All right, so if this group does better than the other group, I should be able to see that on a graph. All right, so here's how you would make the graph. You would just look. Um, obviously, I don't have the actual numbers because we're making up the results here. But what you would see probably is something like this. Um, the grades for uh, this group, which is higher on average than 81%, what I would probably see is more people in the A and B range than the people over here. All right, so uh, let's pretend that uh, I had five people got an A. So they, okay, there's the A, there's the five. All I do is make a bar right there from the A going to the five. You with me on that? In fact, let's actually write this. Um, A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's, not E's. Five, ten. I'm going to keep it just even to make it easy to see. All right, and the data over here would be Something like that. All right. Uh, how would I do B for this one? Go to 10. Go to 10? And then go to B. Yeah, and then make it there. Okay, cool. What about C? 10. 10? And then C. Right, okay. And then D? 5. 5, yep. And then the F, it's a two, you don't have an exact two, you kind of guess where a two would be, but a little less than half up way up here, so it'd be like that. All right, that look good? Well, that should be perfectly even, but there we go. Okay, over here, where do I start? Well, I can start with any of them, but. A. A, up to three, right, so it'd be a little past halfway on that mark. B. Five. Five, yep. See? 15, I go a little higher on that one. And then D, 10. 10. All right. Do those look different? They definitely do. Okay. Uh, so when I'm just looking at the numbers, how they are, without analyzing what they mean, like which class did better, those are just the descriptive statistics. I'm not reading into them. That's just the numbers. Okay? So the numbers as they are, those are just the descriptive statistics. I haven't read into them what they mean yet. All right? But can I actually uh, draw meaning from these two sets of data? Yeah. What, can I, what kind of meaning can I draw from this? Everyone said yes, and no one knows why. <laughs> yes, you definitely can, but I don't know how. <clears throat> How? How do you get that? Because the people that had flashcards have better grades than the ones that didn't use Okay, yeah. So when you look at the data here, you can see that, uh, at least on a grade point um, uh, scale, that this group performed overall worse than that group did. And you can just see that by either looking at these numbers, how they are, or looking at the graph itself. All right? Because I have more uh, data or scores leaning over here. Uh, this is called the negative skew or a left side skew, because the uh, skew, where most of the data tapers off, uh, tapers off in this direction towards the negative, because this side of the graph would be negative, obviously, if there's no negative here. This one is a little bit, it's the opposite. It is a, it's a positive skew, because the tail tapers off towards the positive. So if it's going away from the center point, that's a positive skew, the tail. If it's going towards the zero, uh, then it would be a negative, all right? So that's a good way uh, to tell. All right, uh, and I can see that most of my uh, scores here are lumped over here on uh, this side, on the higher side, so I know that they, they did better overall than that. So that is my inferential statistics. That's me reading the statistics and drawing a conclusion. An inference is like kind of like an educated guess, all right? So in this case, we're guessing, oh, because these scores were better, Clearly, you can see that there's more uh, B's for certain. Was there more A's too? Yeah, there's more A's and B's. Um, and there's less D's and F's in this one. So that tells me that this group did better. 
probably because of my, um, uh, my uh, independent variable, which was what? Flashcards, Flash right. Dated better than them. So assuming that I have a massive sample size and, and I've eliminated confounding variables, which if I did a good experiment, I would, that would be a good indicator that flashcards do help you roughly, you know, 10% on the actual test. So that's a histogram. It's a bar graph, and, and that's how you make them. Does that make sense? All right. Anytime you have a, a quantity of people, those are always going to go, for the most part, on this um, y-axis. That's the y-axis, right? Yes. And that's the x-axis. Going back a little bit in my brain to like high school math. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the y-axis? Yes. Yeah. And that's the, okay, good. Um, so the y-axis is usually going to be the amount of people or whatever you're assessing, and then uh, these are going to be the, what they mean, like the grades in this case, or the height, or the weight, or whatever it is that you're measuring. All right, uh, and that's how you make a histogram. So do we have a rough idea of how to make and read a histogram then? Mm -hmm. All right, sweet. Did I actually start that? Please do. Sure. Right. Thank you. Thank God, <clears throat> I don't want to do it again. All right, that's a histogram. So what's my other type of... Um, scatter plot. Scatter plot, right. All right, so let's do a scatter plot. All right, this is one that we're gonna look for a correlation. Did I tell you what a correlation was? Yeah. Okay. So the correlation, obviously, positive means they both go up together, they both go down together. Uh, negative means they, they do the opposite. All right, so if one goes up, the other goes down. It doesn't matter which one it is, they just both do the opposite. All right, so let's do one for, uh, here's a real one. I don't need the exact numbers, but I know this is how it generally goes. Um, do you think maybe there's a correlation, correlation uh, between intelligence and income. Yeah. Positive or negative, do you think? Yeah. It is mostly positive. I think it's like a 0.6 correlation, which, which is a positive. It's on the positive side, it's positive. All right, so what you'll see here, and again, this isn't, this is, it, it's only a 0.6% correlation. So that doesn't mean that if I'm very intelligent or I'm average or whatever, that I'm doomed, my fate is sealed, but it, it does have an impact, just like we talked about with your personalities, how it's like 10% society, 30 to 40% genes, uh, then the rest is like a mix of consciousness and, and epigenetics. It doesn't mean you're like set, like that's it, too bad, but it does have a, a big impact. All right, so here, here's how we would set it up. What would we do is we would have, um, can we do it either way? I think we might build this either way. I'm trying to think which way would be best for what access we want on. So let's think about that. Um, yeah, let's do income on the y-axis. That would make more sense. So income. So that's usually, again, where you're going to put the number that you're trying to assess. In this case, it's going to be income. So let's say the incomes are, let's just go in like uh, $10,000 increments. So 10K, so $10,000 a year, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. Okay. Obviously, you can make more than that or less than that, but... Yeah, you could actually lose money technically, so you could technically be in the negative, but we'll just keep it simple, zero to 100K. All right, and here are our IQs. So about where you could start marking maybe where a genius is at is in the 140 to 150 region, maybe 160. It depends, I've seen different variations, but if your IQ is over 140, you're, you're in the top one or half percent of people. All right, so we'll, we'll put that at like the high point here, 140, so then 130. 120, 110. 100, by the way, is the average. That's just your average person. And then the lower you go is below average, obviously. 80, 70, 60. If I could get down to here and it becomes really hard to just manage your own life at all. <clears throat> in fact, if you're in the 60 and 70 range, you usually can't live on your own. I mean, you can't make enough money or take care of your daily tasks. You usually need help. There are some rare exemptions, but that's pretty much what it means. All right. So there, there's my IQ, my intelligence quotient test, which we'll talk about later in the year. It's a specific set of um, abilities, uh, but nonetheless, that's the metric we're gonna use for this example. Okay, so here's how I would do it. I would look at the uh, numbers as far as what everyone's IQ, I obviously we want a big or a small sample size here. 
Yeah. Huge. The bigger, the better. And in fact, it's probably pretty easy to get in the thousands on something like this. So we're obviously going to make it up. Um, but what you would do is you would just get a, a, a massive list. You'd want a computer to do this because it would take you forever to plot this and find all the data. Um, well, let's assume that it's there and you have the data available and there's like 10,000 people on there and they have their IQ and they have their yearly income. All right. So what you would do, or the computer in this case, because you would not want to make 10,000 dots on this thing. Um, so let's say the computer does it, but what it would do is it take everyone's uh, IQ and match it with their salary. All right. So let's say, uh, we'll do a couple examples. Let's say it looks at uh, this person, their IQ is uh, 140 and their um, uh, income is $90,000 a year. So what would I do? Do I do a bar? No. no. I just do a dot. That's it. Okay, cool. So I go to the 140. So this guy is 140 or girl's 140. Income's 90K. So I would just match them and I put one dot right there. All right. So obviously you can see if I had to do like hundreds or thousands of these, it would take forever. That's why it's better to have computers do this. Um, but nonetheless, what it's going to look like, roughly speaking, if I go through all of them, is it's pretty much going to form a, uh, a very specific shape. All right, and the shape is mostly going to look something like this. Something like that. And I will have a few uh, ones that go deviate away from that. They're called outliers. They're like really rare instances where somebody with a very low IQ ends up having a really high income and somebody with a high IQ ends up having a low income. But for the most part, it's gonna look something like this. And there's gonna be a lot more dots here towards the center because there's way more average people than there are very smart or very not smart people. All right. All right, so if that's what my results look like, and remember, I would have to look at every individual number and be like, okay, so that person has a 90 IQ and their, and their uh, income is 35K, and I'd make the dot right there. All right, so it take forever to do this by yourself. Is there a rough direction that's, being, uh, that, that's emerging out of this? Where? Yeah, it's like slanted up, like out from the, uh, from the uh, intersection here. So could I potentially maybe draw a line here, and would that be a pretty accurate reflection of how this trend looks? Yes. Yeah, it would. Okay, cool. This is what we know as a positive correlation. And you guys know that, I think, by definition. What does that mean? They both go up together, or they both go down together. So in the vast majority of cases, with some exceptions, you're going to see high IQ is higher income. Average IQ is a more average income. Uh, lower IQ is a lower income on average. Are there exceptions? Yes. right. And you can see them on the plot. But most kind of stick to the same behavior. So in most cases, when this is high, this is also high. When this is low, this is also low in most cases. Right. That's what a positive correlation looks like. It's going to be going uh, basically towards that upper right-hand corner. You may, does that make sense? Okay, cool. So that's a positive correlation. That's what it would look like. Uh, when I do the uh, math behind it, and don't worry, you'll never have to do the math for actually figuring out what the number uh, is for a correlation. But just know this. The number that we would get from all this data, so obviously you can see this chart here, but you get a, you get a number that shows the correlation between intelligence and income. And I believe, like I said, I think it's 0.6. I believe the correlation is 0 0.6, which is a really strong correlation, by the way. Um, because it's not negative, it's therefore going to be uh, positive. All right. So the max you could get, if it was perfect in every single case, when one went up, so did the other perfectly along with it, that would be a correlation of 1. You would never see that in pretty much anything. It would, the best you would ever get for anything, if it was like genetic or gender-based, would be like a 0.9 something, because there's always some exception. Um, but the higher the number towards one, one being the max, that, is, that means it's really correlated. So anything you see from like a zero point, maybe even a 0 0.4 to a one, but you never see one. That means those two are correlated. Uh, in fact, they might even cause one another, all right, to some degree. All right. Um, most tests, when you try to find if there's a correlation, they're going to be uh, really close to zero, whether it's like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, or, or negative 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3, uh, which means 
there's probably not much impact. Uh, there's not much correlation between the two. So if I were to look at, let's say for example, that the two weren't correlated, that intelligence had no impact on your income, it wouldn't look like this. It would look something like this. Is there a trend we can see in that? No, no it's just all over the place. So there's, there's not gonna be a correlation there. All right, so there, the correlation would be like a zero or 0 0.1 uh, or negative 0 0.1, something that's very close to zero. All right, so the closer it is to one, that means there's a much stronger correlation. I mean, okay, these two almost always come together and they probably impact one another, probably. Okay. What about something that might be negatively correlated? Yeah, it would go the opposite way, but uh, let's, let's think of something that we could track that would be probably negatively correlated. I think one of the examples, I don't know if I use it in the notes or not, uh, but usually the amount of time I exercise lowers or increases my body weight. Think about it. If I exercise more, am I probably heavier or less heavy? Less, less heavy. So usually... If I like to say the amount of minutes worked out in a week, if that's a high number, usually the weight is gonna be lower for that person, if that makes sense. That usually means the person is probably also dieting, they go to the gym, they're very conscious about their fitness and their weight, so they focus more on staying healthy, which usually means they have a lower body weight. Does that make sense? Okay, so it would look something like this. So what would we do? We would go with, We would go with minutes worked out. This one's a tough one to see if it works out the right way. Minutes exercised per week. All right, so we'll just go from zero to 100 again. So 10 minutes a week, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Okay, and then this would be like body weight. So for an adult, uh, we'll say this is for adults too, by the way. Adults age 18 to 65. All right, oh, what is that, by the way, if I'm looking at a specific age group? Is it cross-sectional? There you go, cross-sectional. I was like, really? Not one person does it? <clears throat> Hold on. Yeah, everybody else is looking in their notes too. All right, um, so minutes uh, worked out per week, and this would be like uh, body weight in pounds. Because we're Americans and we only know our pounds. All right, so I don't know what's a reasonable starting point for adults. Let's just say 100 pounds, even that's really, really light. We're just gonna use that though. Now, let's say 120. 130, 140, 150, 160. Obviously, wherever we start or end, you can go higher or lower than that, but we're just gonna use this for an example. 170, 180, 190, 200, 210, 220. All right. So let's say I, I work out 100 minutes uh, per week. What's my uh, body weight likely to be? Lower, Lower probably. probably. Okay. So again, this isn't going to be a perfect one uh, because sometimes the goals are different. Like some people actually go to the, the gym to actually get bigger. Like mostly it's guys. But like if you're a, a scrawny guy, you're not going to the gym to lose weight, you're going to the gym to get muscle and you're actually to gain weight. So this doesn't work perfectly, uh, but we're just gonna use this uh, to try to make the point. So all right, let's say these people are trying to lose weight and uh, I go to the gym 100 minutes a week and my body weight is 130, okay? What about people that go to the gym or work out less than 10 minutes a week? What's, where's their weight probably gonna fall? Higher. On the higher end. So let's say like this person goes 10 minutes a week uh, and his body weight is 210, all right? What's my trend gonna look like? Mm -hmm. well, the other one goes down too, like which, which way? It yeah, it's gonna go this direction mostly, all right? So you're gonna find that most people work out on the average, have a more average body weight, and again, this doesn't work perfectly for body weight because there's different goals for the gym and all that, but it's going to look something like this with some outliers. Right, and then up, you'd have probably like a bunch of outliers up here for bodybuilders because their weight's going way up, and they're there at the gym a lot. But is there a general trend I could uh, get here? Mm -hmm. Where is it? This one. Yeah, exactly. This is kind of a general trend. 
All right, that is what a negative correlation would look like. So I may say something like, oh, the correlation between minutes exercised per week and body weight is a negative 0 0.4. What does that mean? Okay, so what does a negative correlation mean? No, they are definitely related. It's how they're related. This is where people get confused. The positive one's easy. Negative's not so easy. It's a negative 0.4. Keep in mind, the maximum I can get for a negative is negative 1.0. That's the max I could ever get. What does a negative 0.4 correlation mean? It, it does mean they're correlated. But in what way are they correlated? Positively? <laughs> Negatively correlated. OK, so what does that mean? So they go down together? Nope, that'd be positive. If they both go down, that's still a positive. If one goes up, the other goes down. That's all it means, guys. It doesn't mean they both go down, because I know that that's technically negative, but they're doing the same thing. So it's actually uh, statistically a positive. So if it's a negative 0.4, it means when one goes up, the other goes down. All right? And we would say that correlation coefficient, which is what this number is, correlation coefficient is that significant are they correlate is a point four indicate that there's probably a relationship between the two numbers like one impacts the other would a point four be considered that yes no maybe so yeah. Yeah. yes it, it, it would point four is a decent correlation like you might have found something there uh, uh, at least partially uh, between the two. what if it was a uh, negative 0 0.8. Would that show that there's a correlation between the two? No. no. Oh, I got you on that one. That would be a huge correlation. Okay. That means almost every time the person goes to the gym a lot, their body weight lowers. All right? So this is what, this is what tricks a lot, of, a lot of students. So again, think of this as my scale for correlation. There's zero, which means no correlation at all. What would that look like on a chart? It would just be dots everywhere. I wouldn't be able to draw a line, okay? The closer I get to a full 1.0, the more condensed the dots become. In fact, if it helps, the one is one line, and the closer you are to a one, the more clearly you can have one line. I don't know if that helps or not. That would help me. Uh, same is true in the other direction. The max you can have is a negative 1.0, all right? So the closer I am to a negative one, or a one, the closer I am to actually having a very uh, identifiable, an identifiable uh, correlation between the two. All right, so let's try another example. What if, erase this and this too. What if I told you there was a, uh, so we got income per year and age. These are my two factors and I told you that if I look at those two, everyone's age and what their income is, there's a 0 0.91 uh, uh, correlation coefficient. What does that tell you? They affect each other. They affect each other, how? A lot, a little? A lot. A lot, it's very close to a one, right? Okay, so what kind of a correlation is it then? Uh, so positive. positive, right, Meaning, which means what? If one goes up, the other also goes up. What if one goes down? It, it also goes down, right? And this is true as well. If I take a bunch of 25-year-olds and I compare their incomes to a bunch of 55-year-olds, if there's hundreds or thousands of them, almost certainly the number, the uh, income for this group is going to be much higher than this group, right? Because they're more experienced. They've already done college. They have moved up in their company. They've created a bunch of works or, or whatever. They put in a bunch of years. So their income is going to be higher, right, than the 25-year-olds. All right, what if I took something like I'm going to analyze people's average time on TikTok <laughs> and their uh, GPA? What if I found there was a correlation of negative 0.2? What does that tell me? There's a very small correlation. They might not even be actually statistically significant uh, in their correlation, but there's a little one. 
All right, and then because there's a negative, what does that mean? Yeah, it's a negative, but what does that tell me? One goes up, the other goes down. So if I spend more time on TikTok in a week, what happens to my grades? It, it might go down a little bit. And this isn't really conclusive, a point two, a point one. It's like, ah, maybe that affects you, maybe it doesn't, all right? But what if it was this? What if it was my uh, TikTok to GPA correlation coefficient is uh, uh, negative 0 0.7? It has a huge impact, in which way? Negatively, which means yeah, one goes up, the other goes down, right? So that means if I if I spend more time vegging on this, my grades are going to suffer, and if I spend less time vegging on this, my grades will do better. Obviously, that doesn't work exactly because some people can get away with uh, screwing around more because maybe they have to know the topic, they're smarter, smarter, uh, or and just because I'm wasting my time here, or I'm not, let's say I'm not watching, I could be wasting my time on something else too, whether it's Instagram or Snapchat or or just any Netflix or whatever it might be. But uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much how you interpret these uh, numbers. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Who could give me an example for Morgan Bucks of something that might be negatively correlated that we haven't discussed yet? What's something that might go up and the other goes down that we could probably find in most people, like a, a, good, <coughs> a good correlation? Well, most people. Um, if you don't study your place Okay, that's probably uh, a good indicator. So, time studied. Hmm, that one would be positive. Yeah, I think this would be positively correlated. So, time studied in GPA. Usually, if I study more, what happens to my grades? They go up or down? They're gonna go up. I'd probably find a correlation somewhere here of like 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 or something like that, which would tell me what? How? Positive. Which means? They both go up. Yeah, they both go, or? They both go down. They both go down, right, okay, cool. What about a negative? So that was a positive. What's one that if I do one thing, something else gets worse or goes down? Mm -hmm. If you do sports, your grades will go down. What? If you do sports, your grades will go down. Sometimes. The more sports you have, the, yeah, yeah, that might, less okay, time cool. To have. All right, yeah, great, that, that's, that's good. So a uh, number of, uh, number <laughs> of, extracurricular, so after school activities, I would probably find, probably, but not in every case, because there's definitely people that do sports all year and then get a 4.0. Uh, but yeah, I would agree that almost certainly if you're doing way more other things after school and missing sleep and not studying, you're probably gonna do work. So what I probably find between this is, when this is a high number, like I'm doing stuff all the time after school, what's probably gonna happen to most people's GPAs They'll probably go down a little bit, right? So I'd probably find a small negative correlation here. I'd probably see like a 0 0.3 to 0 0.1. What does that tell me? It's not that much. It's not that much, right. And it's negative, so that tells me? Negative. One goes up, the other goes down, exactly. Cool, any questions about that? All right, so know how to analyze the correlation coefficient, like what it means, what it signifies, and also be able to recognize it on a scatter plot. All right, uh, speaking of which, if I were to see this on a scatter plot, here's my GPA, right here's a 5.0 all the way down to a zero, and this is the number of activities I have from zero to 10 after school. What's it gonna look like on a scatter plot? Yeah, it's gonna probably be something like this, roughly, with better dots, obviously, with some exceptions. All right, and ideally, oh, like there's kind of a tendency right there, all right? All right, so we got that, all right, cool. Um, easier things, we were talking about a positive and negative skew. Uh, negative means the tail goes towards the zero, where the points intersect, and the, and the positive means the tail goes outward uh, towards the higher numbers. Um, what else is there? Oh, there's bimodal, right? Isn't that in the notes? Bimodal distribution? Okay. That one's pretty easy, too. This would be something like, it's basically when you draw a graph on a scatter plot or a histogram, uh, you would see two peaks instead of one. All right, so like if I, if I looked at average GPA, uh, for the school, I would see something like this. I would most likely just see a standard um, uh, unimodal one, uh, a standard bell curve. I'd probably see something like this. There'd probably be a negative skew, but it'd be like one peak, right? Because I have most people in the C to B range and then much less in the A, D, and F range. It's probably what I would find. Is that bimodal? No. Does that have two peaks? No. no, it's only got one. So let's say, and I'm making this up, let's say we, we looked at one teacher or, or the school, 
and we saw this. Oh, there's a bunch of people failing, not many people have C's and D's, but a lot of people have A's. What would that be? That'd be bimodal, right? Because there's, there's two peaks on it. Those aren't that common. Usually there's a trend um, if it's reliable uh, with, with, a, with the standard one, one peak, but in this case we might have two. And if it was a histogram, it would look similarly like this. Is that bimodal? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Two clear, distinct peaks. Right, if I were to draw a line there. Any questions about that? Okay, so we've got statistical significance, we've got the correlations, we've got the different types of studies, we've got the variables. What am I missing? It's hard to do in your brain, all the notes. Is that all the stuff about statistics? Oh, except for the mean, mode. okay. That one's super easy though. So you've got mean, uh, mode, uh, median, thank you. I was like median, uh, range, and standard deviation. We're actually going to look about how to, at how to calculate that later. But at most, it's going to be worth one question on the 100 you have on the AP test, so we don't really care that much about it. You just want to know what it means. Okay. So here we go. With every um, set of data I take, like if I looked at all the GPAs in the school, um, I can analyze them uh, using these, these, these metrics. So these are uh, collectively known as central tendencies. Meaning, if I looked at all of my scores for the entire school, uh, whether GPA or whatever, I would find that most of these end up around the middle. Like, if I've got my data like this, right, I've got the A, B, C, D, F, not E, um, and the number of students here was like 100 to 2,000, uh, I would find that almost any graph I have for this would be something like this. And the mean, and the mode, and the median would all be somewhere in there. So that's what we mean by central tendencies. You know you've got a weird data set with a positive or negative skew if like, it's like this. It's like, well, they're all over here. That's a negative skew. That means something's probably not right. In this case, what would we probably say about the teacher or school if the grades looked like this, if they had a negative skew like that? The class or the school's probably too easy, or at least they're grading you too easy. Because not everybody is an A and B student in the entire school or not the school, all right? Would I also think that perhaps maybe there's an error in the grading or difficulty if it looked like this and it had a positive skew and my median and mode and all that were over here? What would that tell me about the class or um, uh, school? They're too hard. It's probably too hard, right? Or, it's, or they're not teaching you all over, or something like that. Right. Okay, you're like, what's your grade? Why? If you want to know, mine is usually by the end of the year a near perfect bell curve. Meaning most of you have C's and B's with a few A's and very few B's and F's. And that's actually what tells me if I'm grading or teaching well, by the way. If I get a bunch of A's and B's, like, ah, I probably went too easy on them. And if you were all failing, it's like, ooh, I'm either making this too hard or not teaching well enough. <clears throat> okay. Mean. This is just the average. And this is, these are really simple. I, I've actually been surprised how confused students get on these. I thought these would be, like, uh, standard, but... I, I've been surprised in the past as to how people can't calculate. How do I get the average of a bunch of numbers? Let's say I got these numbers here. Let's say I've got 5, 10, 10, 15, 15. yeah, well, just those. You add them all up and divide by I'd add them all up and then? Divide by how many numbers? Yeah, divide by 4. So I would take the, uh, the sum, put the backwards symbol for sum, is it the other way? I think it's that way, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. Take the sum and then you divide it by the, uh, uh, the number of uh, numbers that there are. So in this case, there's four numbers, right? So that, that's the equation for it, I think. Um, so there's four here. So there's one, two, three, four numbers. So how do I plug that into this? Okay, so I get the sum of them. Five plus 10 plus 10 plus 15, that is 40, right? So, I, so the sum of them is 40. And I divide by the number of numbers, four. which is four, right? I got four over four. So what's my average score here? Ten. Yeah, it's going to be 10, right? That's my mean. That's my average. Right, so that's how you get it. And obviously, the sets might be bigger and all of that, but uh, that's pretty simple. So my average is 10. 
So my mean is 10. All right. Mode, what's the mode? Yeah, it's the most common number. So if I look at all those numbers, which one appears the most? 10. 10, right. That's all I got to do. I just have to count them. All right, there could be 20 numbers here. I would just count and see which one had the most. All right, so in this case, it's 10. There's 1, 5, 1, 15, and two tens. Clearly my mode, the most common number is 10. All right. What about the median? It's 10. Mm, it's not 10. It's not 10. No, it's the middle number. So do I have an exact middle number here? No, because no, it's even. But if I had like a 20 here, then it would be just 10, right? Because I just go, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The middle number is 3. Boom, that's, that's my median. But, and then and that's easy. It's just the middle number. You should know, though, to calculate it if you have an even number. There's no exact middle because you've got 1, 2, 3, 4. The exact middle is between these two. Uh, all you do is you uh, add them together. It's going to be 10 plus 10, and you just divide it by 2. That's, 10. That's it. And um, that would not be, that would be 10. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually calculate. So. You're right. But um, so in this case, it's 10, but let's pretend it was, um, I meant to actually make this so that they weren't the same. Let's pretend it was 12, <laughs> all right? Because that doesn't help us. This might help us. So it'll be 10 plus 12 divided by 2, which would be what? 11. It'd be 11, right? Yeah, so in the case that they are the same number, because I wasn't paying attention, uh, it would just be that number. But most times that you see these, it won't be. So you have to just add the 2 and divide. That's what you do. All right, so in this case, it'd be 11. Understand? Yes, sir. All righty. And the range is even easier. Um, so in this case, we left it how it was, it could be 10 as well. The range. Um, the range is just how, which numbers are there. So you, all you do is take the lowest number and the highest number. And you say all these numbers range from at the lowest, 5, because that's the lowest value, to, what's the highest number here? 15. 15. So is it true, though, that all of these numbers are either are between 5 and 15? Yes. Yes, that's the range. That's all it is. You guys got that? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's my range. And now standard deviation. That one, it's actually uh, quite complicated to, uh, to calculate, which we will do uh, probably next week, or maybe on Thursday. We'll see. But I just want you to know for now what it means. Standard de deviation just means the average difference between the numbers. All right. So if my range is really tight, uh, like it's a, it's a, it's like my, oh, it's like this, five to fifteen. My standard deviation is going to be pretty, pretty low. But if I've got numbers that range from like five to five thousand, the uh, like if this, if these are my five numbers here, would you say the different, the distance between these numbers is rather large because of that five thousand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like this is not much at all. Right, it's only like you know five, to, well, ten at the most, but this is like thousands now in five numbers. The standard deviation would be much higher there. That's all it means, uh, and we'll we'll calculate it later. I'm not sure to what extent how important that is on the actual AP test, but just know what it signifies. So if it's low, that means the numbers are really tight, and if it's a bigger number, that means that the uh, the difference between them is uh, pretty high. Okay, you guys got that? All right. Um, is there anything else statistically? You want to glance over and make sure. I think that was all of them for the statistics. Okay, sweet. I'll uh, take a break and then I'll briefly talk about the ethics because that one's pretty quick. And I forgot to tell two thing. things. I forgot to explain operational definitions and why they're important for an experiment. Uh, and this is just the details on how you conducted the experiment. So uh, let's say we did the flashcard example. If you is as how close we're looking for as descriptive and detailed as possible, you would tell us exactly what you did. So you'd be like, oh, okay, we wanted to find out if flashcard scores uh, helped out quiz grades. So what we did was we took you know 50 classes and then we randomly. Uh, uh, assigned the uh, uh, classes into groups of the experimental group with the flashcards uh, and the control group with no flashcards uh, and then we gave a, a test 
on the content every week for 50 weeks and then put all the data together uh, and got the averages and compared the two to see if there was a, a difference. So be like as much detail as you could offer because you want the person to know exactly what you did. Why is that? Why would you want everyone else to know exactly what you did for the experiment? So if they want to try out the different Yeah, so they'd be able to repeat it. And if it's repeatable, they should, if it's valid, like if you actually found something that's real, not just you happen to get a fluke answer, it should be repeatable by other people. So I should be able to be at a different school, do the exact same thing you did, and get results that are similar. That's what it means. That's what, so that's why they're important. So you do this for two reasons, to uh, find any flaws in what they did, like, oh, maybe they didn't control for uh, uh, age or intelligence or gender or whatever, you know, when they, when they did their uh, assessment. Like, they chose only AP classes or they chose only classes that were mostly women or something like that. Or they only did it once, right? So that means, oh, people could have been sick or tired. There's lots of problems with it. So you want to be able to find any flaws in the study. And more importantly, or, or equally importantly, you want to be able to uh, repeat it. Repeat the uh, experiment and its results. Uh, to determine if it's valid. So that's for both. Determine validity. So again, a good experiment should be, uh, uh, should reduce confounding variables or eliminate them. So you want to be sure that your independent variable, the thing you're looking for, is the only factor there. And you want to be able to uh, replicate the experiment, be able to do it again. That, that for the most part, shows that it's uh, generally true, uh, at least um, the scale we're using it. Okay, so that's the importance of operational definitions. So you might have to, for an FRQ or a written response, read the instructions or operational definitions for another experiment, and you have, you'd have to be able to identify the flaws it might have. All right, you'd be like, oh, well, they didn't, uh, they, they didn't get the uh, consent of the people, which is a rule you have to have for experiments. Like, you gotta fully tell people what's going on, if they're involved, uh, and all the things that could go wrong and all of that. Yeah, so you gotta be able to identify those flaws in the operational definition. That makes sense? All right, cool. The other one I forgot to mention was the importance of what's called a double blind in the experiment. This one's very important because this is a really, really good way of reducing bias. So how am I supposed to pe pick people for an experiment and who goes into what groups? Randomly. Randomly, exactly. So it's really important that it's random so I don't accidentally or intentionally make one group uh, um, better than the other if I'm trying to find quiz results, right? Because I could prove that, uh, oh, actually, flashcards make it worse if I just intentionally put all of the smart uh, people on one side and all the people that aren't as smart or aren't as motivated in the other. Be like, oh, look, see, it's, it's clear. Uh, I could easily do that. A double blind means, this is better for things that are uh, related to medicine, for example. Uh, you wouldn't want to know who's getting the treatment and who's not getting the treatment. So here's an example. Let's say you're trying to uh, cure depression with a medication. So depression uh, can be alleviated sometimes with medication. We'll talk about that later in the year. But let's say you want to find out if this new pill you made actually makes depressed people less depressed. So you understand the premise there, like what we're doing? Okay. Would I just be able to be like, here you go, here's a new pill, it's supposed to cure depression, uh, tell me in six weeks if your depression is better. Would that be a good way of finding out? No. Why not? Yeah, well, first of all, it's one person. Uh, and second of all, uh, maybe I took somebody that I knew that didn't really have depression or uh, has already had medication before that's similar, so I know it would work for them. I, there's all sorts of things that I could use to uh, uh, manipulate those results. All right, so what I want to do, particularly for these ones fixed on medication, is I want to have uh, multiple groups, but I don't want to know who's who. So that way, I don't know what you get, so I don't look for a specific result, because I don't know if you got a real pill or a fake pill, right? And I don't want you to know either, because there's a thing that you mentioned called the placebo effect. All right, it's a weird psychological phenomenon. So for example, um, placebo effect. If I told you guys, hey, um, obviously you wouldn't uh, trust me to do this, but let's pretend you did. If I came into school, I was like, hey, I invented a super pill that makes you uh, much smarter. Like, it helps out your quiz scores, then it'll help you memorize things, understand things better, it'll give you mental clarity, uh, just by a little bit, though. If I gave all of you those pills, and it had nothing in it, it was just like a sugar pill, it, it did literally nothing for you, do you think your scores would go up? Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. It actually would a little bit because you think something is helping you out, so you feel better about it, you're less anxious, and, and you end up performing better. That's called the placebo effect. I can do that for sickness too, by the way. Uh, you, you can give people a fake pill uh, and say it cures the cold or helps out their cold, and they'll actually recover quicker because they think that they're going to recover quicker. Uh, so their brain tells them that they are, and, and they do, or they don't, or at least they think they do. That's the placebo effect. It basically just means you think it's going to work, so that's going to make it work a little better. All right? So if I'm testing out this new medication for uh, depression, um, I want to actually put the real medication out there, but I don't want you to know if you got it or not. And I don't want to know which ones you actually get, because I might give it to people that I think it'll work for or not work for. Right? Because if I find one that works, like I'm going to be rich or famous or something like that. So there's a lot at stake for me. I want this to work. So I want to make sure it's an experiment where I'm not affecting the results by giving certain people the pills that I think it'll help more than others. All right, that's the purpose of a double blind. So what I would do would be somebody else would distribute the pills and, um, or, or, or at least put the pills in the containers. Then maybe I'd get the pills, but I wouldn't know which was which. It'd just be like pills A, pills B, pills C. And I would have no idea which one actually contained the medicine uh, that I was uh, trying to test out. One would be placebo, one of them would be a different medication, uh, and then another would be uh, the actual medication that I'm testing out. And I wouldn't know which one was which. All right, so that's what a double blind is. So I'd give uh, the, uh, so like, let's say there's, there's, well, we'll keep it simple, just there's two. There's pill A and pill B. All right, one is, let's say A is the actual medicine that I'm testing. Pill B is nothing but a, a, a sugar pill. It's just got sugar in it, it won't do anything. It just gives you like 10 calories, that's it, nothing else. All right, if I go, you know, six months, and they take these pills every day like they're supposed to at the beginning. So day one, they report how depressed they are, one to 10, or how many times they're depressed in a week, month or whatever it is. Um, and then I wait six months while they're taking these pills and I ask them again, how often do you feel depressed in a day, like one to 10 or, or whatever? What should I see if my medicine is working? I should see a decrease, where? With the people who have pill A or pill B? Pill A, pill A. Pill A right. What I should see if my medicine actually works is a statistically significant, like a pretty big number uh, difference, uh, reduction in the amount of days that they're depressed as opposed to this, this group here. They shouldn't change much. Let's say their average was, I feel depressed seven days out of 10, right? So this group should say seven at the beginning, they should be saying six or seven or eight at the end. All right, so this group also said, I feel depressed seven days out of 10, and I give them the medication, after six months, it's fully gone through its cycle, it's in their system. Uh, now they should be feeling depressed like, oh, one or two or three or four days. Something that's a pretty big difference uh, between the two. All right, so that's the double blind. It means I don't know which medication you've got. I don't know if B or A is the uh, placebo, which is the fake medicine, or which one's the real medicine. And wh again, why is that important? Why is it important that the experimenter, the one who wants to find out if this pill works, why is it important that I don't know which one you got? Yeah, because that'll limit my bias. Because I, I mean, just think about it. Like, again, if I discover this pill and it works, I can be rich or famous for that, for helping people out. That could be a greedy or a good thing. Um, but uh, I have, a, I have a, um, a stake in this. Like, I, I want the outcome to be good, like this thing to work. Uh, so I might be biased in selecting who gets the pill or changing the results or something like that. But if I don't know who actually got it and who didn't, there's no results for me to actually. Uh, change or, or, or obfuscate or, or, or um, vary. All right, that's double blind. It means you don't know which pill you're getting and I, the experimenter, don't know which pill you're getting. That's pretty much all it means. That makes sense? It's basically like we're both blindfolded and we have no idea who has what and then we just have to see if it helps or not. Make sense? All right. Lastly, ethics. This should be pretty quick. Well, we only have three minutes. It's going to be very quick. Ethics. There's actually rules for experiments. So there's some things you can't do. For example, you can't intentionally inflict pain upon people. Uh, you have to fully tell them what's going on in the experiment, like what could go wrong, what you're testing, and all of that. Uh, afterwards, the experiment, you have to share with them the results, like how things went. And also, what's the other one I'm forgetting? There's a fourth one. Oh, you gotta be confidential. You can't share anybody's information. All right. The reason why you can't share information is well, you might have a psychological disorder or a medical condition that you don't want other people to know about. 
So I, it would be illegal if I shared that you were a part of this uh, program or what the program was about, because you might have a condition that you don't want other people to know about. Like maybe you have a, a schizophrenia or something, you don't want your friends to know that, or them think you're crazy or whatever. Um, so the reason why you can't do that is because the federal government, Congress, passed the HIPAA Act, which basically says doctors, or in this case experimenters, cannot share any of your medical information with anybody else unless you sign off uh, uh, to release it. All right? And that's important because if a doctor or a psychotherapist or an experimenter does share medical information about you, guess what could happen to them? Not just they get sued or they get fired, it's worse. They lose their license, so they can't be an experimenter or a psychiatrist or a doctor anymore. That's a big one, all right? Um, so yes, uh, HIPAA uh, requires that all medical information, including psychiatric, is confidential. So that's very important, and that's one of the four rules. And again, the four rules are no intentional pain or discomfort, uh, confidential, they gotta debrief you after on the results, and they, uh, damn it, I forgot one again. This is confidential already, right? No pain, I already said that. Oh, they gotta fully uh, uh, give you all the information beforehand. So they need your consent, you gotta be fully informed about what's going on, before and after, that's actually two steps. So before the experiment, they tell you what's gonna happen, what they're testing, and after they explain what did happen. And at no point can they share information about you personally, uh, and they, uh, of course, can't intentionally harm you. Okay, and uh, the ones that set these rules, are uh, for humans, as far as what you can and can't do, are the American Psychological Association, the British Psychological Society, APA, BPS. They make the rules, but they're not everywhere. So what they do is they make the rule book. They give the rule book out to uh, what are called institutional review boards. This is really just the psychology departments at universities. And they approve or disprove any experiments you might want to do uh, at like the University of Stanford or, or, or CSC Stanford, or wherever the hell you might be. All right, so this organization in the United States and in Britain make the rules. And then individual universities have boards of psychologists that uh, you basically say, I want to do this experiment. They read it and they say, yep, you can do it, or no, you can't, it violates these rules. So that's what an institutional review board is. And the only thing I want to add to this, the bell's gonna ring, wait one second. They actually have some requirements for animals too, and that's the um, IACUC, which is, oh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for. And we have written down the notes. I always screw up at least one word. Use Committee. Animal animal, care and use there committee. we go. Institution Animal Care and, uh, and Use Committee. They're the ones that make the rules for what you can and can't do with animals and experiments. So that's basically how it works. These guys set the rules for humans, these guys set the rules for animals. Uh, they're not everywhere. So if you're going to conduct an experiment at a university, which is where you do it for the most part, or at a clinical practice, um, these local boards full of psychologists um, uh, and psychiatrists, they're the ones that read your uh, description, your operational definition, and say, nope, can't do that, it violates this rule, or yep, go ahead, that uh, experiment is approved. You guys understand that? All right, sweet. 